was a woman. First time I found someone that was truly alive. At least that's what I thought. Even if it is all just BS, I'm happier chasing after that tiny glimmer of hope. Nothing else to it. An unfamiliar ceiling, a city of the dead, the infinite space of nothing or steam rising into the air, maybe a tower descending into heaven or a snowy battlefield littered with needless death. These are all wildly different places, but one thing ties them together, the observer. Not one person, but rather a collection of them, an idea of someone, a common trait they all share, existing simply to exist. Where they've lost the one they lived for, been betrayed by their god, cast out by society, or experienced nothingness, they are all confronted with one thing, the absurd. Laid out by many, but stressed by Albert Camus, it is not a certain thing, but rather the comparison brought between other things. The human mind which has the ability to reason, and the world which it exists in which has no such thing. This contradiction is the absurd, and it is met when one's nostalgia, their longing for familiarity and things known, runs out. It's the moment where their loved one dies. It's the moment where they see their god is false. It's the moment when they recognize the futility of every action which they've taken. When one uncovers the absurd, they cannot return. They must find a solution. It's here that we'll begin with characters who are searching for that solution, one which they must find to exist for a reason more than existence itself. Or maybe that will be the conclusion we reach. Is there something which is worth living for in this world? This is what Camus is primarily concerned with in the work most of this video is based on, the myth of Sisyphus, where he opens with the famous lines, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest comes afterwards. Before we go any further, I want to make clear I am no expert on the matters at hand. I've done much less reading on such things than I'd like to because time is limited. However, my intent is not to educate directly per se, but rather to inspire a desire to learn. As such, this video needs to only provide entertainment, reflection, insight, emotion, or something else which could spur that desire. While I believe it could be much better, I'll acquiesce to the limited time of making content for the internet and publish it as is. One thing we can agree on across most of the characters we'll discuss is that they have or had some sort of reason for being, whether that was gifted from birthright, discovered over journeys, or anything in between. Despite this, they all faced despair in their primary arcs. I think it's prudent to start with Sunny Boy and Nagara, one of our few exceptions to this stipulation of having had purpose. A fantastically surreal anime, it follows Nagara and his class as they go adrift. That is, they end up in this abstract world where they have superpowers, ranging from a light-up finger to the ability to manipulate the world around them. In this world, death does not exist. No matter how much time passes, they never age, and they will never die. Some former students have existed here for thousands of years, changing forms, going mad, doing nothing at all, and so much more. Some even invent death to try and escape their existences. Raj Dhani, a character who explores this world for thousands of years, puts it best. The self exists for no reason, and it ultimately ceases to be. Life's a constant cycle of vain endeavors. Since it is meaningless, then this moment of becoming is a precious and beautiful thing indeed. The anime makes the case that death doesn't strictly give life meaning, but gives it the potential for it. If we all lived forever, we would eventually become a vague nothingness from experiencing too much. We would simply die a longer death. This is the lesson Nagara takes to heart, someone who never really had a purpose. Long before they went adrift, he already was. He eventually returns to the real world, purposefully choosing to live where death exists. We don't see him find meaning, but deeply understand he now knows it's something he can find, even in a meaningless world. In a way, this makes Sunny Boy the existentialist anime. It prudently states that the world is meaninglessness, and by stressing those characters who have existed for thousands of years and yet still drift purposelessly, it also believes that existence precedes essence. That is, a human must exist before they can have meaning. 
We are not born with one, we are not gifted one, but rather we craft one for ourselves. This is where Nagara's journey ends at the beginning of finding such a thing. It's one of my favorite series of all time and the only piece of media which has ever given me a sense of hope about my own mortality. However, it's made clear that humans could live extensive periods of time without purpose, and so there is no guarantee of it, which is important. In a way, I put Foley Coley in the same category as Sunny Boy for its answer to our question. It also looked at someone who exists without meaning and says, but they have the potential to. We covered this a couple weeks ago, so I'll be brief. Naoto is a boy in stasis. He sees the world as dull and unchanging, drifting through life with a desire for change, but taking no action of his own to produce it. Eventually, Haruko enters wildly and forces change upon him, leading him through a period of heartbreak and suffering to emerge not with some newfound reason for existence, but simply a more positive drive to find such a thing. His story ends in the same place as Nagara. So they provide the existentialist answer to continue, assuming we feel the need of purpose to live. They say the world may mean nothing, but you can mean something by drive and dedication. This is a hopeful answer and one I've come to agree with many times. Humanity was gifted reason for, well, a reason, I believe. As Immanuel Kant argued in favor of the soul, we can act against nature, against our own betterment, a trait which makes no sense in the context of natural progression. So it stands to reason we could craft something worthy of our own lives, doesn't it? However, I think we have to go further than this to test this hopeful idea to its bitter end. As always, we can return to Black Lagoon for a good example. Revy, like our previous characters, is one who exists without meaning. As a child in New York City, she was beaten and abused by her father and the police alike. Eventually, she breaks free from these hostile bonds and flees to Rowanapur, a so-called city of the dead, since no one or no thing changes there. Here she acts as a hired gun for Dutch's Lagoon Company, a sometimes illegal transportation company where she kills without mercy to accomplish her goal. Due to her harsh upbringing, she doesn't seem to ascribe meaning to the world in any sense. While she would never call herself one, we could classify her under existentialism. There was no greater reason for why she was abused, simply the physical reality that those people had more power and more money than her. She lives in service of gaining those things to avoid further pain, and as such, you could call her reason for being to acquire money and power. However, as physical means alone, I think that surmounts to nothing more than existing within the confines of society, and as such would just be considered existence itself. She exists only vaguely, killing countless others for her own gain and hating herself the entire way, secretly wishing for some escape from the life she leads. What we see here is simple. Just because there is a potential for something which makes life worth living, doesn't mean we'll ever experience such a thing. Nagara and Naoto may accept they can find a reason for being, but is this of any value when there is no guarantee? Now, a majority of the characters we'll see have broken past that point and have found something to define themselves value from. So, if a majority of them do, then we could possibly argue on the whole that the existential solution is correct and satisfactory. Now, I think it is correct, and the assumption we can find and create meaning, but is not satisfactory for the exact same reason. A meaning created by imperfect beings can never itself be perfect. As such, it's possible for it to be wrong, for us to lose it, for it to perish, and so on. Then, because it can perish, we find ourselves once again faced with the absurd, only now in a weakened state. It's here we find one of the most famous tales in anime, Spike Spiegel of Cowboy Bebop. I've never shied away from describing Bebop as a perfect encapsulation of loneliness, and that's because the anime is solely about characters who are adrift. They literally float through space, tackling new adventures occasionally confronted by their past, but every time ending in the exact same place, right where they started. They're a found family, but one which we're reminded at so many points can be turned apart in any instant. Spike, once a member of the Red Dragon Syndicate, fell in love with Julia, the girlfriend of his partner in crime, Vicious. Finding out about this betrayal, Vicious sought to correct the situation through violence, only being solved via Spike faking his own death, forced to leave his home and love alike. He eventually teams up with Jet Black and becomes a bounty hunter, but he never quite moves on from the state, saying things like, Look at my eyes, Faye. One of them is a fake, because I lost it in an accident. Since then... I've been seeing the past in one eye and the present in the other. Spike began to live for Julia. 
Without her, he has no reason to continue, at least outside of the fleeting hope they'll somehow find their way back to each other. He's not so much living through hope as he is a simple container for hope to exist within. Eventually their paths do cross again, but only for a brief moment before she's struck down. Not by some grand enemy, not by a even a named character, not for any particular reason, simply because. Now Spike doesn't even have the hope which fueled him. This is where we get the famous line, I'm not going there to die. I'm going to find out if I'm really alive. When he seeks to storm the Red Dragon Syndicate alone and kill Vicious once and for all. I think, despite how angsty that statement is, it does provide a lot of meaning. However fleeting it was, the idea of Julia was enough reason for him to keep on living. He could ward off the absurd just as much as required. However, it was temporary, and without that reason, he's faced with the absurd once again. Without meaning, he isn't sure if his existence even constitutes living anymore. And is there any way to test your very existence outside of facing death? We can debate how healthy defining yourself around a single person is, we kind of have before, but what's not debatable is that Spike found a reason. He existed and then found essence, and then lost it. Faced with the absurd, he was unable to find another spout of essence and he perished. He chooses the path which reconciles the absurd by removing one part of the equation. Since it's constituted from contradiction, if one side, either the human or the world, is removed, it ceases to be. We can see this in another anime you may or may not have heard of, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Asuka is our exhibit for the time being. Her story begins as a child. Her mother, through an unnamed psychological affliction, became unable to recognize her own daughter. As such, she referred to dolls as Asuka instead, leaving her real daughter with a single desire, to be witnessed by others. This crawls into every fiber of her being, from her infatuation with Keiji to her reason for piloting Ava Unit 02. She becomes obsessed with being the greatest pilot because as such, she cannot just garner attention, but all of it. If she saves the world against the invading angels, she'll be forever recognized. Her existence will be eternally validated. Eventually, however, she grows rash and charges into battle against an unknown foe, one which has the power to destroy her mentally. Her psyche gone, she's unable to effectively pilot an Ava unit since they depend on mental synchronization. Here, she finds despair. She leaves the nerve facilities, content to sit amongst piles of rubble disillusioned with her own existence. Her reason for being became so core to her that without it, she is nothing. She falls into a comatose state, unable to continue living, but without the energy to end her own life. The only thing which eventually revives her is the recognition of her mother itself, the very source of her ills. Again, we see someone who found their purpose, but still reaches a conflict with the absurd, still seeks to escape it. For the rest of our examples, I'll go briefly. I from Wonder Egg Priority could also be an example. Stumbling upon a mystical arcade, she gains the ability to fight for girls who have committed suicide, saving their souls from eternal despair, and if she saves enough, gaining the ability to bring one back to life. For her, it's her friend Koito, one of the only people who accepted her. We learn that in a different space and time where I never met Koito, she is the one whose life is ended instead as she fights to save her own soul. In a mixture of two timelines, we see someone like our others who found something to cling to and was lost without it, even if they decided what it was on their own. Vincent from Ergo Proxy is another example, one who fails to become an ideal citizen in a society which refuses to accept individuality. His choices were to die the death of becoming homogenized or perish in the harsh wastelands of a post-apocalyptic world. Faced with these possibilities and confronted with the truth that his actions were for nothing, he contends himself to die rather than standing up to the absurd. He ends up living, but that's something we've better explored in another video. There's also another point I want to quickly address. Our ability to define our own existences via meaning is limited by physics and society and so on. We can't make ourselves grow wings, we can't escape working. Vincent finds despair because his meaning was impossible not from his own lack of effort, but because no one else would accept that effort. We could point to Rock from Black Lagoon as another example of this, but I've recently covered something very similar with him, so I won't do so again here. Now Okabe, specifically from Steins Gate Zero, would be another one. His story is one of time travel, a self-proclaimed mad scientist, he and his friends accidentally invent time travel, or rather the ability to send data back in time. This butterfly affects into the destruction of the entire world, as Okabe is forced to do the one thing he sought to never do, 
hurt his friends so he can save them from this awful fate. His entire being was dedicated to these friends. His mad scientist persona Hoenn Kiyoma arose as a way to cling onto those who mattered. He knows it's false, but maintains it anyway so he can maintain them. While he succeeds in the original anime, in Science Gate Zero he gives up, resigned to live in a world which rejected his reason for being. A mixture of other humans and the nature of the universe decreed he could not exist as he wanted, and so he's left with nothing more than a shell of himself. Okabe lives, but Kiyoma has died. Our world is not ideal, and as such, we cannot contain every meaning within it. Even if we accept we must find our own in the endless nothingness of being, they can be denied. Does this strengthen our resolve, or the draw to the absurd instead? There's also nothing to a reason for being, which states it has to last across the entirety of being. Sometimes they can be accomplished, leaving one with nothing. While the overall anime is average at best, 91 Days of Velio is a prudent example of this. Taking place in the era of prohibition, he seeks revenge on the Venetti family after receiving a letter stating they were the ones who killed his family years ago. Before this letter, he was drifting, speaking to no one as he returned home to an empty apartment. He stole enough money just to exist and nothing more. With the letter in hand, he has a reason to live with vigor once more and does, succeeding in torturing the crime family which stole his own to their very destruction. Consumed by revenge, once he succeeds, he resigns himself to death, proving no contest to Nero, the remaining member of the Venetis who takes him to his death. He found a reason to live, it fixed his state of drifting, but it made him a monster. It led to the death of evil and innocent alike, and it was only temporary. It provided a meaning, but only for a while and only to make the world worse. Once again with Cowboy Bebop, this time we find Faye Valentine. Reversely representative of Lady Luck, she wanders the galaxy throwing away any money she can find on endless gambling. This leads her to Spike in Jet eventually, where her past becomes more clear. A former resident of the now destroyed Earth, a space shuttle accident left her with injuries so bad she had to be put into cryosleep with the hope that future medical practice would be able to save her. 44 years later, that very thing happens, but not before the destruction of an astral gate near Earth, which led to the destruction of anything and everything which could point to who she was. Awakened with amnesia, forced to learn an entirely new world, and under a massive pile of debt, she has nothing. That is, until she's delivered a tape recorded in her childhood, a time capsule sent to her future self. Here she finds a seeming solution to the drift, now she has something to go on, however small. Some adventures with Ed and sudden memories later, and Faye finds her childhood home, only there's nothing left. What she finds is what she already had, an empty space, a gap with nothing but vague memory. The pain and struggle she experienced over this past, the desire which drove her to adventure to it, the things that held her back by not having it, it was all for no reason. Just like that, Purpose had found her and then dropped her, doing nothing but confirming that the absurd existed. Where before she had hope for her past, now she hasn't even that. To stay in the 90s for a little bit longer, we can return to Evangelion and Shinji. His story is one of seeking acceptance in any sense. Son to the head of Nerve, the organization tasked with saving the Earth from the invading angels with Ava units, his father never quite had the time for his son, and his wife died early, leaving Shinji unaccepted. Shinji's sexual advances follow the same desire as he seeks the acceptance of physical connection from anyone who could offer it. As Asuka calls him out for in the end of Evangelion, <laughs> This is the core of Shinji, seeking acceptance and despising the rejection he constantly faces. As it turns out, this is in line with his father's goals as well. Obsessed with regaining lost connection, Gendo provides the means for humanity to be returned to the collective unconscious that is sharing a singular mental being. No one is apart, no one can lie, the living and dead exist alike. As such, no one can be rejected, it simply doesn't exist in a world which is in itself only connection. Yet when Shinji is faced with this reality, when it is achieved, he rejects it, returning to the physical world where people are not connected so. Here, arriving back with Asuka, he begins to strangle her to check if rejection still exists. He discovers that acceptance means nothing if it's forced. To truly live, one must be able to be rejected. He had, in a sense, seen his reason for being accomplished, 
but he also discovered it brought him no more happiness and made his existence futile. Everything he did becomes a net zero and he's left upon a ruined earth. Sometimes the meaning of your life is accomplished. Sometimes it's healthy, other times it's not. Yet we can't find a single example where it doesn't lead to the same place, the absurd. It seems like a distraction and nothing more. It can be rejected by physics or society or time. The answers our characters find also look to the future to complete the present. They see something tomorrow which will make today livable. This is a paradox of the absurd. We seek to quell our worries of death by thinking of a time when we're closer to it. We may well find purpose, but may require the future. When we're seeking to get through the present, can we rely on such a feeling? Now there's nothing within the existentialist answer which says we can't find multiple meanings to solve this. In fact, they mostly argue that dedication to something, not the something itself, is the meaning, and as such couldn't be devalued so easily as it would always still exist within you. However, the human heart is weak. It seeks easy reconciliation within a world which has none, and provides a reason to continue being based on unhealthy thoughts and methods, because humans are unhealthy creatures. Shinji never picks a new reason. He holds sexual power over a shell of Asuka because it's easier than redefining himself. Revy fights because she can't or refuses to understand herself, and as such, she could never define a purpose. Vincent's world is too harsh for him to find anything else. Even if he could, his world doesn't provide a platform for new meanings. We and our societies are too unideal to force our bodies to follow the ideals which are necessary to constantly evolve with purpose. The absurd is too strong. What we see is that they all continue on through a purpose, even knowing it not to be true, even knowing it not to be healthy, because it's an answer which ascribes to some kind of reason. It's an attempt to reconcile the absurd. However, it never accomplishes the goal in a healthy way. It leads them to a hopeful suicide, or to endless stagnation, or to the most awful depths of their capability. Thus, I don't believe existentialism provides us an answer to the absurd. Or rather, I think it's good in theory, but I don't believe humans are ideal enough to ascribe to meaning in a healthy way. We will always create a flawed solution to a universal problem which is bound to fail, leaving us at square one. Encapsulated within everything we've discussed so far are two responses Camus rejects on the premise they don't solve the absurd, but rather destroy the equation by removing one side of it. Spike, Asuka, Vincent, I, Avilio, and more, regardless of how they reached a lack of hope, regardless of the meaning they ascribe to, all seek to remove the observer of the world, preventing their reason from contrasting against the lack of it. The absurd is not solved, but simply unobserved. The other response is to make a leap of faith, in approximate terms, saying the universe actually makes sense, but we simply can't understand it. You could argue that characters like Shinji fall here. Meaning can either be a way to make oneself seem valuable or a means to approximate sense from the world around them. Shinji, by seeking acceptance as this purpose, but lacking it, is taking a leap of faith. The world makes sense, he simply hasn't reached the point of understanding it himself. Nagara and Naoto are a different kind of leap of faith. They understand an inherent meaninglessness to it all, but believe they will find something. But believing something can fill the gaps doesn't quite accept the absurd either. In a way, all grasps at meaning could be seen as a leap of faith. However, none is more explored than that of God. This would be a character like Vinland Saga's Knut. Set near the turn of the first millennium, the story takes place at a time when the belief that Armageddon is near is becoming more popular. Knut is devout in his faith to God, existing only as a meek heir to the throne of Denmark, despised by those against him and a pawn to those on his side. Despite all of this, he finds value in being devout and continues on. He has taken the ultimate leap of faith, accepting that the world is beyond his comprehension and making peace with it. Camus called such leaps of faith philosophical suicide because they seek to create reason out of an acceptance that there is none and as such destroy the very foundation they're built upon. He rejects both responses of physical and philosophical suicide and puts forth his ultimate answer to the question, is life worth living? Yes, and the reason is revolt. I'll do my best to make a quick summary here while at the same time referring everyone to read the original text. In a sense, he's taking the importance of dedication and persistence stressed in existentialism, but saying that should be given to life itself not for a reason to live it. Throughout our lives, we'll be asked to make leaps of faith, but we must reject them because we should only live what we understand. 
We're faced with the idea of ending our own life, but to do so is simply eluding the problem, not solving it, and so we shouldn't. We cannot solve life, and we all have the same destiny. As such, the most hopeful answer is revolt, to live in spite of our fate. The theme of permanent revolution is thus carried into individual existence. Living is keeping the absurd alive. Keeping it alive is, above all, contemplating it. Unlike Eudaces, the absurd dies only when we turn away from it. One of the only coherent philosophical positions is thus revolt. It is a constant confrontation between man and his own obscurity. It is an insistence upon impossible transparency. It challenges the world anew every second. Just as danger provided man the unique opportunity of seizing awareness, so metaphysical revolt extends awareness to the whole experience. It is that constant presence of man in his own eyes. It is not aspiration, for it is devoid of hope. That revolt is the certainty of a crushing fate without the resignation that ought to accompany it. He argues that living in this way, embracing the absurdity of everything to keep it alive and rejecting meaning, is much more free than living within meaning. I think we can see this in our examples. While the despair which finds them is crushing, our characters are actually no more free than at the particular moment in which they meet the absurd. Existing to exist affords them total freedom within reason. Nagara and Nalto, without meaning and aware of the universe as meaningless, have nothing binding their lives. The only things holding them back outside of society and physics are their own mentalities of stagnation. Revy hates herself, but never experiences the kind of failure her counterpart Rock does. A man obsessed with saving others to the point of villainy, he also finds himself in a place where life is entirely dull. However, he does so while bound to one position. He is disposed to continue failing by his meaning, which contradicts the society he's within. Revy never succeeds, but she also never fails. She simply is. Asuka finds depression when no one will look at her, but at the same time, that's liberation. She has no need to try and be the best pilot outside of her own psyche. Her freedom is only limited by the fact she attempted to find a reason for being. Spike can only have the adventures he does because he is adrift. From Rocco to VT, he manages to use his life in a free and assistive way to the world around him because he has no need to be anywhere, anytime, for any reason. Faye may brood in her lack of identity, but she is someone. She is Faye Valentine, a character who we understand and feel for as with any. That which prevents her from being someone is her own idea that she is not. Her purpose to uncover who she is prevents her from being. Vincent is only able to embark on his journey of self-discovery, finding all forms of love along the way because he was no longer concerned with a citizenship which he couldn't even attain. I was only able to begin the quest she did, one which betters her life because she was unbounded. Avelio was able to embark on his tragic reason because he had none. By having nothing to leave behind, he was able to move forward. Whatever the case, the common thread among these characters is that they are faced with the absurd but do not face it back. They turn away and look elsewhere, trying to seek a comprehension which doesn't exist, leading them most often to ruin. This is the sole thing which inhibits the true degree of freedom they all have by existing solely to exist. But there are some who follow a different path, and they are the ones who accept rebellion. Because of their open-ended nature, both Nagara and Nalto fit here as well, however, I want to save the space for others since that pair exemplifies existentialism so well. For once we've already mentioned, we have Shinji. While he found ruin from his purpose, I believe the final few seconds of the end of Evangelion are an acceptance of the absurd by rejecting his leap of faith. In assuring himself that rejection still exists, he is also accepting that his world makes no sense in the way he previously thought. He cannot find a state in which he does what he once believed. He is no longer seeking such a thing, now he is only living. The task which lies before him is the task of life itself. Similarly, Canute is faced with the end of his purpose. Upon being condemned to battlefield death by his father, the king, to make way for his brother to easily take the throne, Canute becomes a simple bargaining chip. He's kidnapped again and again, witnesses a village slaughtered for his survival in the name of monetary gain, and even his own face is splattered with the blood of men who fight for the sake of what he can bring them. He begins to wonder, if God is so kind, why is the world so harsh? He then rebels against what he formerly believed was sense in a senseless world. He doesn't believe that God is not real, but rather that he has forsaken man, since he has left them to toil away at an unachievable goal. He despises this nature, a nature which is in essence God being an agent of the absurd, and goes against it, claiming he'll make his own heaven on earth instead. While this could be seen as a reason for being, I take it as living itself. 
A heaven on earth would be one where people are free, where they live to live rather than living in service of reaching heaven. As such, I see him as an absurd hero, rebelling against a god who is the absurd. In this, he becomes powerful. His success is due to the fact he has begun to revolt, that he has rejected the leap of faith he was born into. However, Vinland Saga is an anime which presents us with its most important and most true character at the start, before showing us the misinterpretation of that ideal character's will. This is Tors, the father to the main character, Torfinn. Once the most feared warrior in the Danish army, he grows disillusioned with the world around him. He no longer sees a point in the death he brings or the death brought against his people. All it is is an end to life. Now a father, he understands life differently. He seeks to escape a kingdom which allows no escape. He fakes his death, returns to gather his family, and flees into the night to Iceland where he seeks only one thing, to live. This is what he begins to define as a true warrior. The true warrior doesn't fight war, but rather he fights existence itself. He toils, he wakes and sleeps every day without fail, he continues simply because he must continue, for that is life's hardest task. He recognizes no reason for all of it, yet he continues anyway. This is an embrace that the absurd rejects, and then a revolt against it. An acceptance of the freedom which comes with it, demonstrated clearly in the life Tors leads. The beautiful scenery, his complete family, the care he feels for life and other beings, eventually even giving his own for them. Tor leads this kind of life which is harsh, but rewarding because he revolts against the absurd. The beauty of life is living in spite of it all. He also embodies something else Camus stressed. If I convince myself that this life has no other aspect than that of the absurd, I feel that its whole equilibrium depends on perpetual opposition between my conscious revolt and the darkness in which it struggles. If I admit that my freedom has no meaning except in relation to its limited fate, then I must say that what counts is not best living, but the most living. While Tor certainly embodies the most living, I think we can return to Ergo Proxy for an unlikely hero. The anime features auto raves, machines which accompany humans and fulfill most of the world's tasks. However, a virus exists which provides them with consciousness. When afflicted, they fall to their knees and appear to pray before acting on their own will for the first time. While the response to this varies, the most important is Pino, a young companion type. Gifted with thought, she briefly questions things like who she is and her place in the universe before finding acceptance and embarking on a journey of living like a human. She doesn't despair, despite being aware of the world to the same degree as every other character, of its ruin and its lack of meaning. She has been fully rebuked of purpose, once destined to be a daughter, she is no more. She is faced in totality with the absurd, and her only response is to live. She learns how to draw, then how to do so with her own ideas instead of copying. She comes to understand what death is, and why people feel so sad when someone else has died. She feels for her father, not because she was created as her daughter, but because she wanted to be. She learns to think, to exist with consciousness. She is living, plain and simple. She is experiencing the most living she can in a world which inhibits living on its very principles. The life of what remains on this planet is supposed to die. Yet she lives anyway. Against her world and against all worlds. With her reason and against the lack of it which surrounds her. Pino is the absurd hero. But things would be amiss without mentioning the original absurd hero outlined by Camus, the titular Sisyphus. Earning the scorn of the gods, Sisyphus is condemned to roll a boulder up a hill, at which point it falls back down and he must repeat the process for eternity. The only aspect of his life is this unending toil, which is tragic only because he is aware of it. His consciousness of every second of this fate he must lead. But this is also rebellion. He is not acting because of his bounds, but despite them. Within the physical confines of his world, he is doing all which he can do to the fullest extent of what he can. His life continues, and it does so because he wills it so, not all exhausted, and the revolt continues forever. Because he is aware, the absurd remains, and nothing conquers him. Camus says, The lucidity that was to constitute his torture at the same time crowns his victory. There is no fate which cannot be surmounted by scorn. Awareness of our fate in living anyway is the answer. As such, Sisyphus has succeeded. This is what leads Camus to conclude with some of the most immortal words ever written, the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. This is what I see in our absurd heroes as well. They struggle against all, embracing their ability to reason and the lack of it which surrounds them. Nothing makes sense. Everything is simply because 
and one day they'll die like everyone else. But they scorn this fate and live anyway. They hold as much power over the absurd as it holds over them and they draw the battle out to its bitter end. We don't find an end to existing simply to exist. All we can do is accept it, embrace it on the whole, draw freedom from it, and continue fighting. Our characters who fail do so because they take leaps of faith because they refuse to revolt but instead attempt to conform to the world. Even if there is no hope, existing to exist is not despair, it is simply the only true state. It is not hope, but it is revolt, the only option. Normally, to end this style of video, this is where I'd add my experience. I'd spin my tale of the absurd, how I faced it, and why I continue on despite a world which, on many days, I fully loathe. A large part of it is the scorn Kemu draws attention to. I live in this world so that one day I might spite it in its systems. That is what keeps me going. Unlike our last video, I cannot offer some conclusion which is more hopeful than that which people before me have laid out. I cannot provide solution from my experience, I can only provide insight. I'm making these recent videos because I see everything crumbling around me, I feel the desire to make this succeed so that I may scorn the world, and I'm desperately making these videos and dumping my emotions out, hoping they reach people and can save me from the hell which I see in daily life before me. I don't have anything more than that to share. So instead of focusing on myself now, I want to focus on you. I've researched and written and spoke and edited. This is where my part of the video ends. The rest is up to you and your comments and what you have to say. I want you to share your stories of the absurd like we covered with our characters here today, becoming the protagonist of this world's story for a moment, letting us all bask in it as the minor characters, and then passing it along. Teach us before opening yourself to be taught, share how you conquered it, how you struggle with it, how you feel on it, anything and everything alike, everything which exists in the spectrum of experience, because we can never be certain of which of our words will help another. Well, all we can do is say them, so fill the space with them even if you think they're nothing or too standard or whatever it may be, because to someone else they may be unknown, they may be amazing. Let us all partake in whichever story helps as I've tried to do here. My final thoughts, as always, are devoted to our wonderful patrons, and to hoping that, yes, I will see you again sometime soon.